And it has, uh, you know, some Grey Merchant, some Night Veil Spectre, some Blood Baron of Viscopa, a Desecration Demon, Obstat, Life Bane Zombie, and then a bunch of black control cards. Uh, it's not so dissimilar from the mono black list that Kentaro Yamamoto actually used to make the top eight. Obviously, it chooses a slightly different threat suite, but it's got a lot of the same hits. Okay. That's Jonathan on your left. On your right, Andrew Tenjin. We saw him earlier in round five with the Esper control deck. He took that down 2-1 over Jory White's red-black deck. Jory kind of mismanaged his resources uh, with a slaughter game, slaughter games in game two. And then Andrew, I think, really got lucky in game three. He had three rips in a row. He had to dissolve to counter a key spell into an Elspeth, Sun's Champion, and then a Doom Blade to kill, uh, I think, a Storm Breath Dragon that was threatening wow. the Elspeth. So that That's was three a, in a row after a Rakdos's return emptied his hand. That's a lot of uh, that's a lot of hits. Uh, Andrew Tenjum is playing Esper Control, as you noted. He's actually one of two players on that list. The other one is Lucas Carlson, who I believe also may be undefeated. I know that he was up to a point. Uh, he may he may have dropped a match since then. I can certainly go ahead and check on that uh, while we wait for Andrew to complete his mulligan. It looks like okay. he kept four cards, so that's a deep mulligan, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> as they say. So this game is almost a throwaway game for Andrew, unless he gets really lucky here. Yeah, Maybe he just were... needs to feel out what Jonathan is playing and get an idea of how to sideboard. Yeah, it's, it's debatable how much play Andrew, given he's playing Esper Control, even wants to do in this match. You know, every card he shows Jonathan is information. And uh, he might be better suited to just learn what Jonathan's playing uh, well, in a lost game. I, I like gonna, to try and battle personally, but I wouldn't blame someone. Is that tell you anything? Blind obedience? I think he can, you know, kind of safely assume Jonathan is on a uh, black-white deck at this point. Once he sees, you know, the blind obedience, the ratchet bomb, like the blue decks have dissolves. They don't need these cards as, as hard. And uh, blind obedience, obviously not that big a threat to Andrew. Main deck blind obedience kind of a nod to all of the aggressive haste creatures. Yeah, it's a singleton card in the black-white deck, and it's a singleton I've liked to see. Uh, as you see on screen here, it's a very effective against Stormbreath Dragon in particular, uh, which is a, a hasty creature that has become very, very popular recently. Uh, however, you know, given the twist we've had at the Pro Tour towards a lot more, uh, you know, long game strategies, leaning on creatures that pump devotion and things like that, it, we might actually see Blind Obedience becoming a less popular option. And uh, Andrew Tenjum goes ahead and dissolves a uh, Lifebane life zombie. zombie yeah. That's the only Lifebane Zombie in Jonathan's main deck. Draws and he Ooh. passes. Wow. Uh, this is actually turning kind of favorable for Tenjum as wow, you know, he's yeah. made some land drops. Jonathan has stopped making them, and in these control mirrors, that's what becomes very, very important. Just the man. Mulligan. Now up to six lands, Andrew Tenjum, and if he draws a Sphinx's Revelation, I think he's he right already, back into this. I honestly think he might already have one in his hand. I think he's oh, just been slow, slow rolling it. No, that's a Supreme Verdict. All right. Well, his hand is Supreme Verdict, Detention Sphere, Doomblade, and a Hallow Fountain he just draw. Blood Baron dies to only one of those cards. Supreme well, Verdict. It's a good thing he has one, <laughs> but not going to cast it yet. It's going to hold off. Maybe he's hoping he can convince Jonathan to commit another threat in the absence uh, of having played a spell. I don't think you should commit another threat here. Blood Baron is a very, very good threat on its own. Yeah, the, I wouldn't commit another uh, creature that doesn't exile itself from play threat. I would be happy playing Obstat here if I had one. Elspeth, Sun's Champion is yeah. reasonable as well. Uh, any card that can continue to generate value in the face of a Supreme Verdict. The, I certainly wouldn't play a second copy of Blood Bear. <laughs> uh, that would probably be the worst thing he could do. Ooh, Gray Merchant. Gray Merchant? Asphodel. Obviously, the Gray Merchant is uh, wanting to get the extra black symbol off the Blood Bear anyway, and he's kind of a minor threat. I would have been happier playing the Obstat that I see in Jonathan's hand, though. Uh, it would drain for two and just create this constant danger on the board. I know there's a Supreme Verdict. Enough value there for Andrew. I was quite certain he'd be convinced to cast it there. Uh, another boon to playing the Obsidat there uh, is actually, you know, your opponent can't answer, or ugh, your opponent would have a fair bit of difficulty answering both of those cards at the same time, Blood Baron and Obsidat. Uh, and one of the best answers to Obsidat is Renounce the Guilds, which the Blood Baron is actually protecting the Obsidat from at pretty much every relevant hmm. point. Another Grey Merchant. 
Franny for two this time. Jonathan has not drawn a sixth land, so he cannot Grey Merchant and use the Extort Trigger from Blind Obedience. Uh, I think Jonathan's main motivation in playing these Grey Merchants rather than that Obsidat... Oh, I'm sorry, he doesn't... Does he actually not have a second white source? I assumed that that thing between the two swamps was a plains based on its different art, but it is possible it's a swamp with I, different art from the other three swamps. It's hard to tell. It's a yeah. revised land. I think it's a plains. I thought it was a plains as well, but I just realized that it is possible I'm mistaken. Plains. So if so, that would be obviously the biggest reason to hold back on playing Obzet because it's not legally castable. Uh, we have confirmation it is a plains. Right, okay. Uh, well, in that case, I, I really think that Jonathan is probably aggressively playing around the card Dissolve uh, and maybe, you know, other spe counter spells like Syncopate and whatnot because he just wants to try and ensure these opposite resolves. But his opponent mulligan to four, he, he doesn't really need to play around these cards that many, that much. Uh, how, how many could Andrew have realistically drawn, you know? Uh, it's going to be much more effective to just jam the best threat and kill your opponent with it as it's unlikely he has a sufficient answer. And Jonathan is now has now decided that's exactly what he's going to do. Just sticks the opposite at. He's convinced that Andrew doesn't have the, the uh, counter spell that's necessary, and now the opposite will likely clean Andrew up in short order. Or maybe not. All that time that Jonathan gave Andrew has allowed him to draw into Elspeth, the Sun's champion. That's not going to get it done though. Here, the tokens are going to come into play. Tapped. If Andrew has nothing else, yeah, but perhaps he can, well, I suppose he's actually just going to be wind up, uh, yeah, they're not, okay, he's tapping the tokens, yeah. And it seems clear that Andrew forgot about that effect that, of blind that obedience. Been the case, yeah. It's possible Andrew can try and represent an Azorius charm here and keep the opposite out of combat, but that's not going to be the case. And the yep. judge replacing the soldier tokens. So a forgotten blind obedience, uh, well, a blind obedience, I should say, takes down that game. Well, these cards you don't see a lot of. Like, right now there's a lot of new cards that people are having trouble playing around uh, because they're, they're not used to them yet. But Blind Obedience has been around for a while, but o only sees marginal play, most often in sideboards, as a one or two of. So the Blind Obedience effect there, and especially Andrew playing an Esper control deck is definitely not used to seeing Blind Obedience because, again, if it's in the sideboard, no one's going to bring that in against a control deck. Yeah, it's going to be rarely relevant against his deck as well, considering how creature light he is. He, in fact, has no creatures in his main deck. He only has the Elspeth, which generates some, and Ashiok, which does the same. Uh, but it mattered right there with the Elspeth, yeah. three soldier tokens entering the battlefield. Yeah. The, the, the greater concern Andrew with the time that Jonathan gave Andrew on holding that offset is actually that Andrew would draw one of the cards Jonathan was scared of in the first place. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're playing against counter magic, it, it can be very tempting to, you know, hold your spell until you've uh, baited out the counter spells. But when you don't actually have enough pressure to do that successfully, you should probably just jam it. Because if they don't have it, you resolve your spell. Uh, and if they do have it, you know, you make the trade that you didn't really want to make. But if you just keep holding, it's real possible they just draw the card. And then you're in the exact same boat, except they've gotten you know extra time, extra draw steps. Dissolves a the kind of card that only gets better as the game goes along, too. Andrew was sitting there making land drops. Uh, the second that he hits a Sphinx's Revelation, that game's in, a bit in bad shape for Jonathan, regardless of the board position, pretty much. Yeah, recall that Andrew Tangem did mulligan to four cards there. A reasonably so he put up a good fight. Four, yeah. that, that game looked like it was going to be a slaughter when it was four cards to the full amount, but it certainly wound up being an actual game of magic, uh, albeit one in which Andrew was still severely disadvantaged. If he had drawn an Elspeth Sun's or sorry, a uh, Sphinx's Revelation, perhaps the turn before he drew that Elspeth Sun's Champion, or even the turn that he did draw that Elspeth Sun's Champion, it might have been enough to dig him back out. If you'd like yeah, to certainly would have been a tight race. Come to the stage and start right away. One spot left in a commander call. Okay, so Andrew Tenjum down a game. What's he got in the sideboard for uh, this matchup? Well, he could bring he can bring in his own Blood Barons. He's got probably will. Glare of Heresy. No, actually, Glare is not going to do anything against Blood Baron. Not going to do anything against Obsidian. Uh, actually, not very useful. Yeah, the only this card. Deck. The only cards that it can answer that are in Jonathan's main deck are his own Elspeth, a Blind Obedience and an Alms Beast. He has one of each of those cards, so that's, you know, not really ideal. 
I think Andrew Tangelum's sideboard plan is to not mulligan to four. What do you think about that? That's probably Would you a, recommend a key that plan. to the players out there? What do you think of his uh, thought seizes and duresses? And I guess even to a lesser extent, maybe his negate, you know? Like, these are relatively specific answers, and I, I actually kind of just... I think I like him in the matchup in, in general, to be honest, but I'm not 100% sure. I, I like sure. Thought Seizes because, especially opposite that is such a high-impact threat that it's hard mm -hmm. to answer. Just nabbing that at a certain point is always good. I, I don't know about Duress. Eh, duress is okay, but the creatures are the things that are really threatening here, right? Unless you want to... I guess against a black deck, if you get into a Thought Seize war, you won't have dresses to take out their thought seizes, etc. <laughs> yeah, I think I like the thought seizes, but I don't think I like the duresses. Uh, I I could see myself being interested in a negate or two. Uh, forcing them to commit actual mana to their spells before I trade with them is a little better than you know paying a mana and a card to get rid of a card they haven't even cast. Uh, looking at Jonathan's sideboard, he has a second copy of Underworld Connections in his sideboard to go with the first one. He'll certainly be bringing that in. Uh, he has one Wear Terror, which is an effective answer to Detention Spheres. He'll likely be bringing that in as it you know, lets him reclaim his Underworld Connections, which can frequently be removed by the Detention Sphere. He's got Wear Terror? Yeah. He, do, he does not have the ability to no, make just the Red Mana, does he? No. Uh, There's got to be something better Is there? Is there cast. a better Disenchant? I don't know. He's May also got a... Uh, gain some life? Yeah, that's, that's a little expensive, three? bro. And in the matchup he's bringing it in, in, like this one, you know, he doesn't really need the three life. He needs the cheap spell. He has access to three Sin Collector, which are by far his best weapon in the oh. matchup. Shaheen uh, was uh, raving about Sin Collector earlier. I bet. He, he's, a, he's a man who no doubt loves his Sin Collectors, and, or I should say, he loves to play them, hates to see them played. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's that's calling them the enemy. Because uh, they come down and they take the supreme verdict that you were planning on casting. There's an interesting singleton in Jonathan's sideboard, Erebos, God of the Dead. God of the Dead. I think I kind of like that. Pay two life, draw a card, yeah. in addition to the Underworld Connections. Uh, well, Andrew Tendrum is not very aggressive, so the two life that he's paying, that, that's not going to be that big a deal pretty frequently. And the fact that it actually shuts down Sphinx's Revelation could you know, matter a fair bit. He's got to be the aggressor, and his deck's not well suited to it. He's kind of clunky as far as aggression goes. He's relying on his threats being, you know, threatening and durable and just lasting for a few turns, or being like, you know, Grey Merchant and generating a little bit of value before Andrew eventually gets rid of them. Grey Merchant of Asphodel. A surprising constructed card, I would say, for a 5-mana 2-4. It's the best 5-mana 2-4 I've seen played in constructed in some time. Now you're just going to make me go <laughs> do some research. <laughs> I'm going to try to get Gatherer to do a search on 5 mana 2 fours now. See if I can narrow it down. The early turns here start as expected with each player making some land drops before Jonathan jams Sin Collector. Sin Collector sees a Sphinx's Revelation, a Tension Sphere, an Elspeth, an Aetherling, a Blood Baron, and a land. I think he's going to take the Sphinx's Revelation, Ricky. Yeah, always take the Sphinx's Revelation. Well, in this case, it's his only legal option, so it's a, a near oh, certainty. Is, I've never seen this before. He just took a photo of Andrew's hand with his phone rather than write it down. Kind of interesting. Uh, I don't believe we uh, actually allow players to access their phones in the, during the match anyway. Well... So uh, reviewing that photo is going to be... As long as he... Like if it's if it's just in camera mode and he looks at the photo again, I think the main concern is you give him a pass at notes. Yeah. Alright, I mean, I, I, certainly that's the main concern, but uh, you gotta, gotta kind of watch those things. Alright, so I have done a gatherer search for converted mana cost 5, <laughs> two fours, and we have Todd Anderson's old friend, Veilfire Liege has come up. That was, that Is was not that the card I was thinking of, I'm not gonna lie to you. Blinding Angel, that's another the card nice I one. was thinking of. <laughs> Sin Collector jams in on Jonathan's side for two damage. Andrew still having no reply. We actually still know his hand as he played a Hallowed Fountain, not the island that we already saw there. Juniper Order Ranger was part uh, of some Jonathan, infinite combo decks. Jonathan messed this one up. He plays a second Sin Collector knowing his opponent doesn't have an instant or sorcery as the Hallowed Fountain was the card that Andrew drew that turn. So oh. either he really wanted a 2-1 in, in play, which is pretty unlikely since he saw Blood Baron in Andrew's hand, or... Uh, he neglected to realize that the land Andrew had. He took the photo to the and then he didn't consult the photo. Exactly. 
However, with Andrew tapped out, Jonathan's got some sweet options. He can jam Obsidat, his own Blood Baron, or Whip of Erebos, and they're all pretty powerful. I think I would be inclined to go with the Whip, uh, as it makes sure every other creature survives pretty much forever, okay. but De the Detention Sphere is an issue. Definitively, the best converted mana cost 524 in Magic history is Maloku the Clouded Mirror. Maloku the Clouded Mirror is pretty good, yeah. I don't know. Sorry, Balefire <laughs> Liege. <laughs> Seaborn Muse, good if you're if you're in the commander realm. Jonathan uh, decides not to risk getting his Whip of Erebus Detention Sphere, likely wisely, and plays the Obsidat, and then immediately exiles it. So this is going to be kind of an awkward racing situation. Blood Baron of Viscopa, you know, Versus generating Obsidat. an eight-point life swing against an Obsidat that's generating a nine-point life swing. Glenn Jones, better at math than me or Shaheen. To be fair, Jonathan does have those two Sin Collectors that are actually, you know, kind of giving him a, a boost as well. He can he can outrace just the Blood Baron. The issue is, can he outrace Blood Baron when it's going to be backed up by, like, Aetherling and Elspeth and Jace? Uh, and that's probably a no. Well, Jace goes minus two here, flips over three cards. Another Jace and a Supreme Verdict. No answers to the Obsidat. Jonathan evaluating his hand and decides to make Jace the most important card from the Jace. Uh, Andrew needs the lands, so he's actually going to take that. A seventh land gives him access to Aetherling with a blue up, which is pretty much the, the best thing that an Aetherling can be. Okay, opposite that comes back. Drain. Opposite that, Ghost Council. Much better than the original Ghost Council of Orzova, especially without damage on the stack. That card would be Dare unplayable you. now, right? I wouldn't want to say such a thing. I have fond memories of Ghost Council. Sorry, Glenn, it's just not good enough. Dude, I love my Tallow Wisps. I love them so much. Oh, you played the Spirit. <laughs> Tallow Wisp. Jonathan trying to decide what to do. He's got two Whip of Erebos, another Blood Baron, a Night Veil Spectre, and a Hero's Downfall in his hand. Uh, a few of those cards are not doing much. He can play one of his Whips. It will likely meet a Detention Sphere. He can play his Blood Baron and get okay. exposed to Supreme Verdict. Activate Nykthos. Make three mana of either black or white. Uh, I believe he can make four mana uh, of black or Oh, yeah, yeah. Some one. collectors yep. each adding one. He's going for the Whip of Erebos. Uh, puts into play. Uh, as we noted, it's likely not going to be long for this world. He attacks, but that's not going to do anything. It's not going to gain him any life. No. Unless he Protection. sends both. Yeah, yeah. you got to yep. send the Sin Collectors. So now Andrew Tendrum has to decide. Looks like he's just going to block the Obsidad. Yep. Deal four and gain four from the Sin Collectors. Or sorry, the deal... Yeah, deal four and gain four from the Sin Collectors. He sent them all at Jace to eliminate it. Uh, so, this, this attack was fine. He did manage to eliminate the Jace, and he knows there's another one on the bottom of Andrew's deck. Doesn't have to really worry about a second one. Note his board would have been getting a lot worse if Jace started plussing. Those Sin Collectors, not getting in much. Okay, it looks like he blocked a Sin Collector. Okay, that was unclear based on uh, how they established, but considering he attacked Jace, that makes it a much better block. Yes, when you're on a camera match, okay. do people a favor and move your cards to what you are blocking. Because Andrew Tangent oh. probably said what he was blocking and... It actually appears that he did his... block the Obsidat and it became confused. Uh, obviously, if they're all attacking Jace, unless he considered the five, the, the additional life that Obsidat's going to gain, the three extra life to be a factor, uh, he should probably have blocked the Sin Collector to eliminate it. I, I think what actually happened is maybe he just said block and tapped it. And now they're debating as to what was actually blocked. No, that is not the case. Okay. No. So they blocked they the rule that he blocked the Obsidat with Blood Baron. Uh, could have taken an opportunity to eliminate a Sin Collector there. So um, Jonathan gains four life from the lifelink on the Sin Collectors. Okay. Andrew gains four off of Blood Baron. Fires off of Thought Seize. With Whip of Erebos in play, it's also debatable that Andrew maybe, you know, wants to be careful about killing Sin Collectors. They could come back and do some pretty unruly things. Yeah. So the thought sees we see a Night Veil Spectre, Blood Baron of Viscopa, Hero's Downfall, and that second Whip of Erebos. So what do you take here? 
I think I take probably. Will I was gonna say the whip or the specter, but Andrew takes neither. It takes the hero's downfall. Uh, maybe he's just jamming his aetherling right now, tapping out, and that's why he did that. Nope, he's jamming Elspeth. That's not bad. It's not bad. Oh, I'm, I suppose that that makes sense. To if he has yeah, Elspeth, yeah, yeah, to should take obviously the hero's take downfall. downfall. And he still has that aetherling. Uh, and yeah, now this board is really twisting about in his favor. Yeah, because the soldier tokens are going to hold the Sin Collectors at bay, and the Blood Baron is keeping Obsidat down. Mm -hmm. He'll well, still he's... continue to lose two from the drain, but we have to keep in mind, one, Elspeth is going to eventually ultimate if that Obsidat doesn't start getting through for actual damage. Right, so rather than hold back the Blood Baron, Andrew attacks with it to gain the four life off the lifelink, and he'll probably just chump block yeah. the Obsidat here. I think that's a fine play, especially considering you know his soldier tokens aren't that great. Uh, and he doesn't really care about how much life Jonathan gains. That's the primary reason to hold back the Blood Baron, is to prevent the gain five from yeah, Obsidat. He, he needs to keep his own life total up high enough that he can stay in this game, yep. find some Spence's Revelations, chain those, draw a bunch of cards, get back in this overwhelm Jonathan Brostoff with card advantage. Yeah, it looks like Jonathan just got one of those awkward moments where you have to be like, yeah, I got pretty lucky, and uh, slam Glare of Heresy onto Elspeth's son's champion. He just yeah. peeled another answer to the Planeswalker after he thought seized off of his only one. And uh, he's probably debating, you know, should I let this Elspeth keep going a little bit? Maybe I can generate some value out of it. Uh, but I think he's going to wind up glaring it. I came up in a similar, similar situation with playtesting with BBD where I, I allowed him to grow an Elspeth for a few extra turns because I believed it was better to develop my board rather than actually go ahead and just kill it immediately. And Jonathan is going to attack first. He's going to offer Andrew... Yeah, he'll take it. Yep. Take it all. Which now, as you said, the Whip of Erebus can get those Sin Collectors back. Yeah, uh, Andrew is blocked with all of his tokens. Jonathan gains nine life and loses his two Sin Collectors. Uh, loses in quotes. <laughs> gains access to their enters the battlefield ability once again. Yep. Now keep in mind that he knows Andrew still has an Aetherling and a Tension Sphere in his hand. He doesn't know what that third card is. So, Glare of Heresy the Elspeth. And cast Night Veil Spectre. And then Obsidat hits the Exile. Yeah, very important. Every turn you gotta remember that Obsidat trigger. Andrew draws a syncopate. Not a very useful card when you're you know, beginning to fall behind on the board. So that was an exciting sequence of events there. Yeah. Thoughtseize taking Hero's downfall from Andrew, clearing the way for his Elspeth son's champion. We, we thought that was gonna turn the game in his favor. But Jonathan top decking the glare of heresy to exile Elspeth. Now Andrew, all he can do is attack with the Blood Baron, gain some more life, keep himself healthy. But facing down an Obsidat Ghost Council, Night Veil vale Spectre, and a Whip of Erebos with two Saint Collectors in the graveyard. Yeah, Andrew's gonna go aggro here and summon an Aetherling. Uh, now the real question I think here is whether that Aetherling is gonna block Obsidat and then exile itself, opening it up to Hero's Downfalls or Doomblade. Uh, or whether Andrew will take the five. Well, that would have to be another amazing top yeah. deck from Jonathan. We know his hand exactly. Andrew it's, knows his hand. It's a low percentage peel, but it All would but be one. a big risk. So uh, I think that Andrew may need to take it, honestly, because taking another five is a big deal here. He, he really doesn't want to take that damage. Sometimes you just gotta, you know, uh, cross your fingers and, <laughs> and tap that man. Uh, I mean... I would probably do it every time. Now note that Jonathan has kind of implied he might have it uh, as he did not use Whip to summon back a Sin Collector before attacking. Mm -hmm. uh, tapping out his man, tapping his man in that fashion would actually have, you know, given Andrew the, a clear pass. So he's saying, you know, eh, maybe I've got something here, but Andrew decides to call anyway. And I obviously, you know, I'm proud of the call. Did he, he maybe actually pumped? just pumped? And block the offset and trade here? 
That's also not a line I disagree with significantly. Yeah. I think that's fine too. Get rid of that offset. Well, I honestly think it's like it's no, close to the same. But that's not going to work because of the the whip. Okay, and then maybe yes. he's actually exiled. Please report to the stage. If he was going to, if he was planning to untap and desphere the whip, then maybe that would be reasonable. But it doesn't look like that's what's happening at all. Yeah, I think um, he exiled the eighth ring. That would also be a really bold line because you'd have to assume Jonathan's not going to use the second main phase, just whipping back opposite. Yeah. Right? So, and when you whip back an opposite that or an aetherling for that matter, because the abilities exile them, mm -hmm. the whip does not care. It says you're exiling them. Oh. I, don't, I don't need to exile. Oh, he pumped toughness. Okay, that's basically the same difference, I suppose. Uh, but it lets Jonathan gain life. Yeah, I, I don't know. So what's the benefit there of pumping the toughness? Honestly, I don't have one. If he thought that putting three damage on an obs, that might matter somehow this turn, but I don't think that's possible. And so, is this a whip or a hard cast sin collector? Uh, this like is a whip, whip sin collector, and he casts another one. Oh, he casts Blood Baron. Oh, of... That's what he hit with uh, Nightmare Spectre, so the Godless Shrine into Blood Baron. Hitting a verdict here was not that big a deal, as Andrew wasn't really planning to cast one since he was leaning so heavily on his Blood Baron. But now that Jonathan has played his own Blood Baron, uh, it's kind of a bigger deal. So the the uh, the Night Vale Spectre hit that Godless Shrine. Yep. You can tell with the color of the sleeves. And that gave Jonathan enough mana to whip a Sin Collector and cast Blood Baron. Yeah. Andrew's uh, got to get something together here. He risks just dying to that whip, and he knows that there's a second whip still in Jonathan's hand. Do you ever, in a situation like this, just try to go for a line to, to get Jonathan to mess up? Say, geez, if you play that second whip, <laughs> I'm dead. No, I don't think so, mostly because... Jonathan would have to have forgotten that there's a Detention Sphere in Andrew's hand, and he's seen his hand uh, three times now. That's a lot of times to see a Detention Sphere and forget that it's there, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I don't anticipate that happening. What he really needs to happen is he, he needs to desphere that whip and then be able to syncopate the next whip. The problem is that Nykthos makes that quite difficult. Yeah, so much devotion mana yeah. with the, when the Obsidac comes back, and now with the Night Vale Spectre on black. Andrew's opting to instead go on the aggro plan and just try to get his opponent a little dead. He's going to desphere, I imagine, the whip and hope to find another answer. He's certainly casting desphere based on how he left this mana. But he's going to go, oh, the specter, okay. That's not so dissimilar. So he's really just on the, I'm going to try and race whip of Erebos plan while my opponent's obstating me and has a blood barrier play. I got to be honest, that is not a plan I think that I think is destined for success. You can't win that race. Uh, I, I think that Andrew, perhaps based on the mana he left open, intended to, uh, quote, untap Aetherling on his turn, uh, but has now not done that. I'm not sure, though. Otherwise, we missed out on a point of damage we could have got in with our Aetherling on. Or maybe he just really wants Syncopate for one available, specifically? For what? Doesn't really... I can't think you, of you can't really. already You can't already deal with yeah. what's on the board. I think we may have just slipped a little here and uh, forgotten to say, you know, before I go to my end step, exile either way. So, whipping another Sin Collector. This time before we attack. So, nabs that Syncopate. Andrew takes a healthy boatload of damage. 10? 11, right? I'm sorry, the Blood Baron is also, is that is that a uh, 10, 10 Blood Baron? Yeah, no, we not, were... Not quite yet. Well, we were... He has, he has oh, an opponent is 10, 10 or less, I'm sorry. We're getting there. And then casts another Sin Collector. Exiles the uh, Obsidat. Okay. Well, the Blood Baron will be 10, 10 next turn. Andrew draws. Immediately well, he's going to get, no, if he attacks with... He's going to get some life, but the Obzat's going to drain some of it back. And I'm not even sure if he can afford to attack. If he attacks, he might just be dead anyway. 
His opponent's threatening does go six, to attack. nine. His opponent's threatening him with 11 damage at least. The Sin Collector Disney. blocks the Aetherling. Gonna gain another two life. Andrew the deals four and gains four with the Blood Baron of Viscopa. And then Andrew does correctly okay. get his Aetherling exiled on his turn, and now he's going to pass Andrew, turn. Andrew, players, if you'd like to register for tomorrow's Legacy Open, there's still a little time to do so. Magic players, there is still time to register for tomorrow's Legacy Open, but we will be closing pre-registration soon. Okay, gets the Aetherling back, passes Jonathan, gets Obzidat back. Andrew goes to 11. Uh, he's, he's, one, he's got one life keeping that uh, Blood Baron from going nuclear on him. Can we see uh, more, more whip on Sin Collector? That's what I'm guessing. We've got five. That's five mana generated from the whip right there. Gets back Sin Collector. There's still one mana floating. In response, Andrew uh, appears to be going to cast something. Sphinx's Revelation? Far and away. He fuses a far and away. Uh, that's going to bounce Obsidat and kill Blood Baron. That's actually a, a, pretty a pretty sweet swing for him. Well, you mentioned that killing an Obsidat is not that useful with Whip of Erebos already in play. Uh, so he decides to bounce it, sacks the Blood Baron. Uh, you know, whipping a Blood Baron back is decent, but it's certainly not going to be a, uh, the kind of game-breaking play that Obsidat is. Andrews, you know, he's clawing his way back in here. Using that floating mana, Jonathan has exactly yeah. enough to recast I was just going to say, he still had the floating mana. And Andrew, you know, continues to hold on to his, his tenuous life total. Yeah, very tenuous. Got to keep himself above... 10. Otherwise, when the whip brings back the Blood Baron, it's going to be a monster. We also have to keep in mind the possibility that Jonathan still has Grey Merchants in his deck. At this point, I'm kind of thinking he might have sighted them out, uh, but you know, that's that's reach. He can actually just you know take Andrew down without the combat step if he needs to, or he can pre-combat get Andrew below 10 for that Blood Baron bonus. If he can get enough mana off of his Devotion... Andrew attacks for 12. Drops Jonathan down to 32. <laughs> and then it looks like he's going to oh play Aetherling again before he untaps. Yep, passes the turn back to Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, despite this whip opposite that setup, is actually uh, starting to lose a little ground. Getting Just away. a little. Yeah, he's he's not you know in trouble yet, but uh, I would I would argue that Andrew is you know climbing up because right now this board is pretty stable. Uh, he can take a hit from that blood baron that's in the graveyard once and it's fine while using the aetherling to chump the opposite at. Uh, I say chump, but uh, obviously I mean you know block Blank, and then yeah. flicker out of play. Here we go. Shrine making f no not shrine. Uh, it looks like he's considering casting his other whip, perhaps. I don't think I like that. Oh, he's got a life beans on me, just true. Well, that's a sweet threat, as it can't be blocked by uh, the Aetherling. So it's an additional threat he can just leave in play. And, you know, it kind of matches the Blood Baron's life, life gain uh, that Andrew's getting. Every point counts right here, because yeah. he's trying to get into a situation where Andrew Tendrum is a 10 life or less before combat, so that he can whip back a giant Blood Baron. That's... That would put a lot of pressure on Andrew Tenjum, along with that Ghost Council. Looks like Jonathan is debating casting his Night Veil Spectre as well. The Flyer, also not bad. Earlier we saw Andrew Tenjum commit a Detention Sphere to get rid of a Night Veil Spectre. Yeah. So the Flyer plus the additional cards in this mana, Jonathan can cast anything out of Andrew's deck. Yeah, that's actually really important to note is that with a Night Veil Spectre in play, Nykthos can generate blue mana, uh, which lets him cast blue cards that might be revealed by Night Veil Spectre's own ability. 
Uh, and considering that Esper, that Andrew is playing Esper Control, a black, white, blue deck, that means Night Bell Spectre in play allows Jonathan to cast any card he exiles. So Jonathan attacks first, makes Andrew blink out the Aetherling, taking down any potential dissolve mana, and then casts the Night Vale Spectre. Uh, a question from online is that we can't whip the Baron since it has protection from black, but it actually only has that ability in the graveyard, or in play, I should say, not while it's in the graveyard. This is true. Andrew attacks once more. Uh, not making anything unblockable. Needs to save all of his blue mana to keep Aetherling alive at all costs. Uh, I think he would welcome any block that yeah, yeah. Jonathan decided to make. You know, it's like, oh, that creature's going to stop attacking me? Sweet. <laughs> he's actually trying to stress Jonathan's mana a little bit. Like, he's gonna, if he's going to you know, whip me, I want him to be paying full price the whole time and not casting cards he draws with his draw step or Night Vale Spectre. And this is one of those rare situations where Aetherling is attacked, what, four, five times? Yep. And it's not getting the job done. <laughs> Shaheen, Shaheen Also to mention, it's not right necessarily now. even on the player's side who's winning the game. Uh, Andrew is at best at a, a stable point here, I think. Attack, attack, attack. Jonathan fearlessly ships everything in the red zone. Blocks... Presumably the opposite deck. Yep. That's the only creature he can block with the Ling. And he's going to take five, and Jonathan's going to gain five, and an island is exiled. Well, that makes those blue cards a little easier to cast. A Sphinx's yeah. Revelation for Jonathan on that next Night Vale Spectre hit would be just a delight. <laughs> a Nykthos-powered Sphinx's Revelation, I might That'd add. That would be a lot of cards in life. And now Andrew Tenjum draws Jace, Architect of Thought. That's actually a, a fairly effective change on this clock. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, turning Night Vale Spectre into a 1-2 and Lifebane's Omni a 2-1 when they're on offense. That means that he might actually pull ahead in the race uh, as Whip is only going to gain 3 life per swing and that amount of damage is actually going to take a fair while to chew through Jace, Architect of Thought himself. He'll go to 5, take 3. Uh, he'll go to three and then die and then Jonathan will be able to actually start attacking Andrew directly which you know by then he presumably will have significantly more life from his own blood bear. so the Jace is huge I think we're going to see this game turn off of the Night Vale Spectre it's going to hit something I mm -hmm. think so far it's hit two lands which Jonathan has played and has continued to make land drops off of Andrew's deck but eventually he's going to hit some kind of action spell and anything right here would be pretty devastating. Uh, looks like he's just sending his Blood Baron this time. He's, you know, decided to saving slow his, down. Saving his mana. Because he needs two of the blue to cast Jace. Yep. I think he just really didn't want to risk uh, Jonathan finding a way to be able to kill Aetherling in response to him doing anything. Uh, so... He's playing cautiously now that he's no longer, you know, with his back against the wall, dead to the next combat step. But now he's at... Now he's at 10. He is at 10. So is this the turn where we whip... Whip up some Blood Baron? Well, well Jonathan will have to recall this particular interaction. He's also only oh, at 27 himself, so, so he would need a way to gain some life before... Maybe he's forgotten that he's been so concerned about getting Andrew to 10 mm -hmm. that he hasn't been keeping track of his own life total. So, because he did use the whip on the Blood Baron of this creature here. I think that he's aware. I think he's just planning Doesn't to jam care. the Jace. Because just... uh, he can actually kill the Jace if he uses the Blood Baron as well. Okay. So, I, I, I don't know if this attack is going at Andrew or the Jace. If it's going at the Jace, the Jace will definitely die. Uh, there's a four, a three, a two, and a one all attacking the Jace. He can actually doesn't send even the, need the one. He, yeah, he Night can just Vale send, can attack Andrew and right. draw another card. That's actually for the best. He can send Night Vale Spectre and Andrew and everything else at Jace, killing Jace uh, for sure. So Aetherling on Obsidat. That's the attack Jace I, I presume is being made. Jace dies, and we exile for Night Vale Spectre. Yep. All right, here we go. No? 
damn it, did you spot the card that was hit? I haven't actually... I don't think we've actually exiled it yet. They're, they're talking, so maybe they are calculating the life totals first before resolving this trigger. Yeah. Okay. Saying, okay... It's certainly gain, getting a little complicated. One, two, three, he gained four, six five, this turn. Six life. So that Andrew should put takes him to 33 one. and Andrew to nine, yep. It's a dissolve. All right, that's actually quite spicy. <laughs> as long as he keeps two land and a Nyctos untapped, he has a dissolve. Okay, so Ghost Council exiled to his own trigger, Blood Baron exiled to the whip. Okay. Oh, wow, so the Night Vale Spectre Maybe has done the job here. Yeah, you may have uh, made the read correctly on Nightville Spectre. It's certainly uh, the most important card on Jonathan's side right now, as strange as that seems to consider when there's a board with Whip of Erebos and Obsidat Ghost Council. So Nykthos, yeah, he can he can generate three blue off of the devotion of the Nightville Spectre yeah. itself. Andrew sends in another 12 damage. Goes Not enough. 13. It's it's this race is getting tight. He has drawn another land. Obviously not especially useful to him, but he exiles the Aether, he brings it back to block. And uh, Jonathan, while he has access access to resolve, he just needs one more card to put the board state in his favor. Right now I think it favors Andrew, but not by a lot. Uh, you think it favors Andrew here? I think this board right now favors Andrew. If we just if the both players stopped drawing cards and just continued to play magic. Andrew would win. Oh, but I mean, if, yeah, both players stop drawing cards, yeah. but Jonathan's drawing an extra card. That's what I'm saying. Jonathan Bell actually Spectre. needs, but he still needs something to hit. He has to hit a relevant card in order to make this board turn it back in his favor. And it doesn't take much. You know, another life bane zombie would actually be might maybe be enough, uh, but it, it does need something. But now he's gaining full value without the Jace. He's gaining full life off of the Whip Life Link. Oh, he's so still he's getting gain shorted five the, here. the five on the offset. That's the bit problem. He's only gaining five a turn. And he's Andrew's gaining seven a turn 12. total with the trigger. Sure, sure. Se seven a turn, including offset's trigger. But Andrew's attacking him for 12. He's making headway. Yeah, okay, I see your point. And he's point. only getting in five damage, and Andrew's gaining four. four back. So Andrew's losing one life a turn and getting in five damage a turn. That's so a very profitable Let's trade. see what's on top of the library. Spin the wheel. Far and away. away. Far and away, the best reveal <laughs> for uh, oh. Nightmare Spectre. Uh, Jonathan can cast that while leaving open Dissolve mana uh, because he has that he has one extra island. island. Yeah. But he just goes for the away, gets rid of the Blood Baron. All right, he just goes for the away, gets rid of the Blood Baron. I guess there's not really much motivation to do anything else since Andrew has enough blue mana to protect that Aetherling till Kingdom uh, Come. Aether, yeah, Aetherling just doesn't do anything yeah. anymore. And, and, and Jonathan declines to cast the Desecration Demon Andrew this turn, which also would have been a big game changer because he wants to keep access to that Dissolve available. Oh, our judge our judge on the director clarifies, you actually couldn't have fused far and away because it wouldn't have been from the hand. Oh, of Good course. Good catch from Shoebox, our judge. Uh, but it wouldn't have mattered if he tried to fuse it anyway, so I don't care. And Andrew uh, makes the only attack he can make. No longer gaining the four means he's not actually breaking ahead. Uh, against that attack for five. Now he's thoroughly behind. Yeah, he's now probably he's just behind. dead here. Not quite. He's not stone he dead. Goes to one. Yeah. Goes to one. Will be dead on Jonathan's next upkeep, barring uh, a pretty, pretty impressive draw. And assuming Jonathan goes ahead and casts, I mean, he's got the dissolve as long oh. as he, as long Flips as he a, has El three mana. Elspeth, El casting an Elspeth off of a Night Vale Spectre. Have you ever seen this happen before? No. That's just, oh, that's brutal. It's, it's kind of icing on the cake, though, really. That that Nykthos and that Dissolve under that Night Vale Spectre were the game. Andrew is drawing a uh, stone dead on his draw step, but he's going to take it. See what it is. I guess Supreme Verdict would actually, like... Mm. No, he'd still be dead unless he had a way to gain life as well. If he had another spell and Supreme Verdict... But his other card in hand is an island. You mean Supreme Verdict doesn't gain you life as well? Well, Jace is a card capable of drawing two cards, so should Jonathan somehow... Uh, he remembers okay, to use he his dissolve. If he had let that resolve, Andrew theoretically...
theoretically could have maybe done something that actually was the uh, Attention player but. says time in the round. Active player finish your turn, then proceed to five additional turns. Once again, players, that is time in the round. Well, they're going off. Jonathan has won this round, and uh, you know, I now that I see this play out, I, I take back what I said before. Actually, I think I like the black-white side of it a little better, uh, especially oh, after it wins. Well, the sim like collectors it's, it's are the favorite. sim collectors are a big deal post board, uh, and they both get into blood baron fights. But Jonathan's actually a better blood baron deck too, which you know you wouldn't really expect since Andrew has access to far and away and other colors.